Okay, please welcome at uh, uh, Gustav Björksten. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so my name is Gustav Björksten. I'm the chief technologist at the international uh, digital rights NGO Access, and uh, we've been running. Uh, Tor servers since 2009, uh, and in the in the spirit of uh, philosophy, uh, I hope to tell you about some of our experiences. It's going to be fairly high level, uh, and in this talk, I hope to encourage some of you to uh, participate in uh, providing extra capacity to the Tor anonymization network. Uh, so what this talk will cover, I'll give you a quick introduction to access, uh, and then I'll talk about our experiences with hosting issues, server balance. Uh, I won't actually be talking about configuration tweaks, I just put it in there to let you know that that's probably what everyone else would talk about. Uh, I'll talk about handling of abuse claims and managing vulnerabilities and user expectations. So Access is, as I said, an international a digital human rights NGO. Um, we have uh, offices in uh, New York, Washington, D.C., uh, Brussels in Belgium, uh, Tunisia in North Africa, Manila in the Philippines, San Jose in Costa Rica, where I'm currently based, uh, and we have members in India, Kenya, Argentina, and Australia, and we're expanding all the time. So our mission is to defend and extend the digital rights of users at risk around the world. Uh, and we do that through three uh, approaches. We have a policy approach, which uh, hopes to uh, influence legislators and policy makers uh, around the world to put in place uh, legislation that uh, you know, fundamentally protects the digital rights uh, of users. We also have a we have an advocacy uh, arm, and uh, they really have two approaches. One is to run campaigns and try and get grassroots support to put pressure on uh, governments or corporations to do the right thing. And the second thing which we've started doing is uh, lobbying. And so we have two lobbying units. One is in DC for the, uh, the US domestic uh, area, and the other is in Brussels, uh, hopefully to uh, lobby and put pressure on the European uh, Commission uh, to, uh, to get them to do the right thing there. And what we've found is that those two, uh, those two uh, centers, so DC for the US, area and uh, Brussels for European Commission, whatever, whatever legislation goes in place there will usually then filter uh, out to other parts around the world. So, you know, there'll be data retention uh, laws put in place, uh, and then, you know, you'll see them pop up in sub-Saharan Africa or, or, uh, or Southeast Asia. And lastly, we have a technology arm, and uh, I'll speak a bit more about what the tech arm does. Uh, so the main thing is that we run a 24 by 7 by 365 a digital security helpline for civil society. And so that is uh, primarily uh, assisting journalists, human rights defenders, bloggers, activists uh, around the world. And uh, anything to do, you know, in terms of security. So. Uh, you know, helping them set up secure communications, um, helping them if uh, they are the victim of a security incident, and we help them recover from that and so on. Uh, we do a small amount of software development, usually that's in support of the helpline. Uh, and the, the last thing that we do, uh, as I mentioned before, is capacity for the Tor network. So what does that capacity look like? Uh, I'll go through some diagrams in the following slides to, to illustrate. Uh, but the Tor network is uh, made up of bridges or entry points into the network, uh, relays 
and then exit nodes. And uh, as it says there, we have decided uh, to be in the, in the business of exits. Um, and as with everything in the sort of liberation technology space and the space that we operate in, uh, trust is the killer app. And uh, uh, there's nothing like it. There's no app that's going to come close to uh, being able to have trust uh, in this space. And, and I'll show you how that applies uh, in the Tor network. So this is the uh, Tor anonymizing network. You have a user. Uh, when that user uses the Tor network, they're allocated a bridge, which is their entry point to the network. Uh, the traffic will bounce around through relays uh, in the anonymizing cloud there, and then the traffic will pop out an exit node uh, to the resource that the user wishes to go to. Now, as you'll notice there, I've marked in down the bottom some rogue nodes, a rogue bridge and a rogue exit. Uh, we assume that uh, entities that want to uh, defeat the anonymizing um, you know, purpose of the, of the Tor network are running you know, arrays of, of bridges and arrays of exits to try and uh, compromise the network. Uh, so if a user uses a rogue bridge and they are also allocated a rogue exit, then you can do a correlation attack uh, between those and uh, possibly identify that that traffic uh, belongs uh, to that user, which we don't want. That de-anonymizes the, the network. So what we're looking for uh, is this scenario where, uh, you know, if, if the user is allocated one, uh, either a bridge that's compromised or an exit that's compromised, that correlation attack should not be able to occur. Uh, so this is where I say trust is the killer app. Uh, what's really needed is trusted uh, bridges and trusted exits. Uh, we don't want anyone running bridges and exits uh, because then you destroy the trust. So access won't run bridges and exits uh, because then we could be accused of being able to do that correlation attack ourselves, and obviously we don't want that. So we've chosen just to concentrate on exits uh, to, uh, to, de to, to defeat this, um, this attack. So uh, learnings. The first thing is uh, hosting issues, and the first hosting issue is location. What location uh, to, uh, to put your Tor nodes in. Now this is a uh, Creative Commons uh, diagram which shows uh, two things. It shows the raw number of Tor users from countries and it also shows uh, you know, the density of users in those countries using Tor. So how many per 100,000 uh, you know, internet users in that country. What, what we're looking at really here is the raw numbers. Uh, and as you can see, there's a lot of um, Tor users in the US. Uh, there's a lot uh, in Europe, in you know, Germany, uh, Italy, France, and Spain. Uh, and the thing is, I, I don't you know, have the evidence to, um, uh, to you know, directly point to this, but my gut feel is that uh, you know, Tor is good for those users. Uh, because what we see is that uh, the vast majority of Tor infrastructure is in those countries. They're in uh, Europe, they're in the USA, particularly in terms of Europe here in Germany, uh, and so everything is good and fine. You try and tell someone in uh, Namibia to use Tor, and they tell you it's too slow. <laughs> um, and that's probably a fair thing, because uh, if you look at Africa, uh, on that map, uh, it's tiny. There's a tiny number of, of Tor users there. But is that because they don't know about it? Is it because they're not connected? Uh, certainly, there's no shortage of need uh, for Tor in Africa. Uh, and, and likewise, in, in uh, Asia and Southeast Asia, that's a region of the world that has more than half the world's total population. Uh, and uh, it has more than half the total internet users and yet we see a very small number 
of uh, Tor users from there. So I think the thing is that we need more infrastructure in different places, in places where it currently isn't. So if you're going to run Tor nodes, let's try and put them uh, in those locations that will matter. This is a terribly simplified map of uh, submarine cables around the world. Uh, but what it does show is uh, that you know if you wanted to uh, have Tor servers that were servicing, uh, say, West Africa, it'll give you an indication of where might be good places uh, to locate that. So you know there are certain points on this map uh, that I think would be ideal to add more Tor servers, like you know Brazil, uh, Singapore, uh, places like that. So uh, keep that in mind. So more hosting issues. Uh, commercial operators, when you, you know, approach them and say, I want to run uh, an array of uh, Tor servers, they're like, great, here comes some money. Uh, so their default position is always going to be to say yes. Yes, we can serve you. We will take your money. Uh, and then you, know, you go through all the effort of building the boxes, configuring them, tweaking them, learning about the environment. And, uh, and then suddenly they turn them off. Uh, because there are consequences uh, to running uh, Tor nodes, particularly uh, Tor exit nodes. The first of those is abuse claims. Uh, we know that while Tor is a fantastic tool uh, for protecting the identity of users at risk, uh, it is obviously also used uh, by people uh, for nefarious purposes. And so uh, when you run exit nodes, uh, people will be attacked. And you know, if they contact the, uh, the hosting provider, then that can become an issue. Uh, sustained bandwidth is another issue. So normally when you, you know, get some hosting and you put up a website, you, know, you might be concerned about the speed of that website and get a large uh, bandwidth allocation. And, uh, but th the reality is that most of the time, it's not getting anywhere near that. There might be a few peaks, you know, just after lunch, so on. Uh, but for the most part, in terms of the hosting provider, it's not an issue. But if you run big Tor exit nodes, for example, it's just going to be solid. <laughs> it's going to be a solid bandwidth suck. And if the hosting provider is not prepared for that, then that can cause an issue. There's obviously um, also retribution attacks. So someone gets attacked uh, through your exit node, uh, and instead of going through the normal process of notifying uh, the hosting provider and so on, they will just uh, you know, fire up a DOS attack or something. And there can also be pressure from law enforcement. Um, so you know, uh, sometimes we run up uh, tour servers and it gets shut off by the hosting provider and they won't tell you why and I kind of suspect that that might have something to do with it. So what can you do? Uh, you can certainly explain to them up front, uh, explain to them what Tor is, explain to them what the consequences might be, um, but you know w without again a trust relationship between you and the hosting provider uh, it's very 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 frustrating because you can put in an enormous amount of work uh, to get your Tor nodes uh, running well, only to have them turned off. And you need to monitor access to those servers. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing is that uh, we want to make sure that those, those servers are not compromised, so you need to monitor them. So server balance is the next challenge. Uh, we started out by taking bare metal servers and just running one node on them. Um, and you know, working with that, and then we realized over time that it seemed to go much, much better where we took a bare metal server with a lot of capability and then ran a huge number of uh, virtual uh, Tor exit nodes on top of that. So I can't, I can't tell you what, you know, how much RAM compared to how much CPU and all that kind of thing you're going to need uh, because every environment is different. Uh, but you can you know, use a systematic approach uh, to that problem uh, to work out what is best. So there's you know, all your normal resources, bandwidth, latency, uh, CPU memory, disk space, and so on. Uh, but what you find is that 
you start to optimize something that's a problem. So let's say it's bandwidth. So you work on that and you get that so that that's kind of optimized. Then you'll start finding that there's a CPU problem or a disk problem. So you just got to keep uh, <laughs> working at the at the problem that's uh, closest at hand, and uh, and hopefully you'll you'll get a, a nicely optimized machine. Uh, as I said before, if you virtualize, it gives you more scope in terms of juggling those resources, and I think that's what made a lot of difference for us. So when you start to get it right, uh, just you know. Um, the bottleneck will move somewhere else, but just keep going and, and you'll eventually get a good machine. So you monitor the resources on the machine, monitor the, the Tor performance, that's obviously important because that's what it's all about. Uh, so uh, when you, you have that information, then you can use trial and error. When something starts to work, keep going in that direction. And document, document everything that you do. Uh, we had a massive, uh, RAID array failure, and uh, we lost a very large number of nodes. And then, you know, we were quickly scrambling to rebuild it. And I looked at one of my colleagues and said, Right, so get out your notes and let's, you know, configure this thing really quick. And he's like, I didn't take notes. I thought he was taking notes. And uh, it turned out that none of us had taken notes. <laughs> and so that was, you know, a year of fine tuning. Uh, that we then had to go through the process of learning again. So be prepared for catastrophic failure uh, so that you can run them up uh, really quick. Configuration tweaks, as I said before, uh, that's something that gets talked about a lot. Uh, Google is your friend, look it up or come and talk to me afterwards. Uh, but I do want to talk about the handling of abuse claims. So, when we started this in 2009 and up to probably the end of 2012, uh, we were frequently visited by men in dark suits and dark glasses. Uh, they would come to the office, uh, they had, you know, received some attack against the government or something and they were looking for the culprits. We even had one hilarious incident where we were all, the whole organization was away on a retreat up in the mountains, and they'd obviously been trying for days coming to our office and no one was there. So they decided that they would go to the uh, operations director's apartment in New York at 3 a.m. in the morning. But of course, he wasn't there. But as you know, apartments in New York, uh, that's valuable space, and so he had... Uh, Airbnb beat it out to someone and uh, so at 3 a.m. there were six guys in dark suits and dark glasses uh, knocking on the door uh, and he was a bit freaked out. <laughs> that no longer happens. Uh, we really haven't had any of that happen uh, since the end of 2012 so clearly uh, for whatever reason the agency's now grok tour. Uh, whether it's just by number of cases or whether it's that they're taught or, or I don't know, but that seems to be the situation. Um, so for uh, the recipients or the victims of attacks uh, that uh, are perpetrated through your exit nodes, it's very important how you handle those because I've seen them handled really poorly uh, and I think we did them poorly initially, and we've gotten much, much, much better at it. So you need to explain to them what Tor is. You need to acknowledge that Tor is the harbinger of malicious attacks. Um, and you need to tell them and spend the time going through with them what can be done about it. So mitigating the attacks, uh, there's those things there, outbound blocking at, at your exit node, or there's various strategies they can use to prevent traffic either from just your Tor exit or from all Tor exits going to their resource. Um, but there's a human side to this, and, and we've definitely uh, experienced that human side. You know, we've had uh, people contact us saying they're being stalked, they've been threatened with rape or, or, uh, or with, you know, death threats and all that sort of thing, and they're usually very, very upset. So. Uh, you need to treat them with the utmost respect. Uh, you need to take the time 
uh, to listen to them, to work with them, to understand their situation, uh, to explain to them why you're doing it, uh, explain to them what it means to someone in Syria. Uh, you know, for them it's a life and death situation. So, uh, and, and if you go through that process, the result is usually really good, uh, resoundingly good. These people usually, if you take that time, will completely do uh, a 180 and uh, will become, you know, supporters of Tor, whereas before uh, they were thinking it was the worst thing that man had ever created. Uh, you do have to obviously do the legal bit of, of covering your ass. So, uh, and you know, when you have legal people write these things up, they're very cold. So you need to find this balance. Uh, we have, as I mentioned, a 24 by 7 by 365 uh, digital security helpline. Uh, it has the ability to respond to those abuse complaints really quickly, which I think is very effective in, uh, you know, letting those people know that uh, we care about the situation that they're in. Uh, hopefully we're able to respond in a language that they speak. Uh, so that also helps. Um, and, you know, this has really become now a crank-to-handle activity. Uh, we run a lot of exits, and so we get a lot of abuse complaints, uh, but we're able to just crank that handle and get that process moving and explain to them uh, what they can do and so on, and it's usually uh, the result is very good. There's also the possibility, maybe in the future, of uh, you know, using a facility like ours uh, for other operators out there to handle their abuse complaints so they don't have to do it themselves. And lastly, there's the managing uh, of the vulnerabilities and user expectations. I mean, Tor is a fantastic tool, uh, but it is not a silver bullet for every threat. That needs to be understood, uh, both you know, from the operator's perspective, uh, but you also need to educate the users as to when it's appropriate and when it's not appropriate. Okay. Thank you. Okay, and now we have some uh, minutes left for questions. Please use this opportunity. We have two microphones next to the beamers on the left side and on the right side. If you have a question, please come to the microphone and uh, ask. Thank you. Yes, please. Um, so, it's not really a question, it's a, a couple of comments. I'm, I'm Lena from the Zonion. We are a not for profit organization running towards you know, in France. I'm missing some advices, so I'm going to say them very quickly. Get a lawyer. Have a lawyer walk with you if you want to run Tor Exit Nodes. Never run Tor Exit Nodes as an individual. Or oh, I think it's way... Uh, you get much, much better cops reaction if it's a legal body uh, as a moral organization than if it's an individual. Um, and uh, have also very uh, proeminent contacts, like get a fax line because cops send faxes, get a specific voicemail, uh, be ready to handle like uh, visit in person and, and uh, email. Uh, yeah, that would, that, would, that would be uh, what I missed. Excellent. Thank you. That's okay, all thank you. fantastic advice. Get a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, somebody else wants to share experience or ask a question? Now it's the time. Hi, I'm sorry, this is not exactly uh, maybe your field, but do you know of anybody running uh, entry nodes? Like many, many entry nodes? Instead, uh, so the opposite of what you're doing. Uh, yes, uh, there are projects uh, to run lots of entry nodes. Um, I mean, there was certainly some projects, I don't know what the status of some of them is, uh, is now. We ran one uh, before we were running exits, which was called the, um, the Global Proxy Cloud, which was a cloud of entry nodes. Um, I know that the Tor project themselves uh, did a similar thing, where they encouraged people to run up uh, bridge nodes on the Amazon uh, web services. Uh, 
Yeah, so, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question. Somebody else? Hello. On the matter of correlation attacks, you mentioned that you don't want to be running an entry or an uh, exit node uh, in the same uh, uh, entity. Is that true for any combinations? Do you have to make a choice for only entry, only exit, only relay? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, this is like uh, not in physical location. We're talking about just an entity. So access as an entity should not run uh, entry points and exit points because then we could be accused of having the capability of, of doing correlation. And there's no uh, combination uh, at risk when you involve relays? Uh, on a bridge in a relay or a relay? No, in a no, it's really the entry and the exit that, that matters to map, you know, because you can see certain information at either end uh, to identify the user and at the other end to what they're going to. So that's, that's the danger. It's the entry and the exit, uh, not in the middle. Uh, you could still, you know, run uh, private bridges for, I don't know, your own people or friends that, you know, super trust you and that sort of thing. But um, in terms of, you know, out in the, out in the public uh, sphere, you should pick one or the other. Clear. Thank you very much. Thank you. Another question, please. Yes, you, ans uh, you insisted fairly heavily on the fact that the entry point, uh, well, the entry guard and the exit node should not belong to the same person, obviously. But if I'm an honest uh, non-profit setting up uh, and, uh, Tor nodes, I will set up the my family flag, and Tor will know that all of those nodes are, belong to the same person, and it will not select two in the same circuit. So. I'm sorry, but that makes no sense. Okay. Um, well, let's talk about it afterwards and okay. sort that one out. Yeah. Now, question from the left microphone, please. Thank you. Uh, I had, well, when I used Tor uh, in Europe, it works perfectly. But when I had to use it, and I was in China, uh, it was uh, but very slow. I could not um, like exploit it. I had to turn to a, a VPN. I had to pay for a VPN. Uh, so, do you have any suggestions like how to overcome this? Do you think that uh, with the passing of time, the situation will get better? Um, well, I mean, you know, th this is essentially an arms race. Uh, but instead of, you know, with missiles, it's an arms race uh, on the internet works. And the, the fact is that the Chinese have worked out ways to identify uh, Tor traffic and, uh, and, you know, they tear the connections down before um, uh, you can get anything through them. So there, there are strategies to deal with that. Uh, there is the OBS proxy uh, modules puts Tor over other protocols to um, conceal it. Um, you know, your mileage uh, will vary. Um, it's, it's, there are a couple of places where Tor is very, very difficult to get to work. So China and Iran um, being the, the two main ones. Yeah. Thank you very much. And now question from the right microphone. How you doing, mate? Um, I had a little question about uh, the correlation attacks. Uh, uh, I don't know if you know, but I was uh, wondering about your thoughts about uh, Astoria, if you're familiar with it. No. Uh, we shall talk after then. Okay, great. We have time for two more questions. Last two questions, somebody? Yes, please. If you're considering contributing to the Tor network and you have the bandwidth um, to spare, what does the network need more of? Exit nodes, relay nodes, or bridges? That is a very good question. And I would love to know. <laughs> so, uh, what, we, what we definitely do need and we have needed for a very long time is more analysis of this exact problem so that uh, we can encourage people to be running up the right types of things to get the right balance of the network. Um, I encourage you all to jump into that research because I want to know.
Thank you. And uh, somebody, last question. Use the opportunity, ask your questions, share your experience, bring your ideas. Okay, it seems nobody. So uh, for special requests, you can talk to, uh, to Gustav and um, yeah, enjoy the club and the camp. <laughs> and um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.